Ladies and gentlemen, we have been, uh, we were in a pickle on technology, and I am of, not only of no use, I'm in the minuses for usefulness of chat, so all I can do is uh, stand by and, well, if we were not so secular an organization, I would, I would be praying, probably for the <laughs> breakthrough there, and uh, that has happened, so now we're all, we're ready to go, we're all set, and so I am, Happy to tell you that the University of Colorado at Boulder is now officially signed up as a commemoration partner in the Vietnam War 50th anniversary commemoration. So this is our first event uh, as commemoration partners. We'll be holding at least two events on the Vietnam War a year, and we will now receive the question of presenting lapel pins as uh, Vietnam War commemoration partners. We now have lapel pins we can give to Vietnam veterans that thank you. Says uh, great thanks for your service. So we will be uh, doing that at the end of the evening. So after the talk and after Q and A, then we ask you to stay with us for a few more, a more minutes so that we can have that first of our ceremonies. Um, so in this undertaking <laughs> to become an official commemoration partner, bureaucracy in Washington D.C. was involved. <laughs> that can break the spirit sometimes, uh, and my spirit doesn't hold up too well into that. So it mattered tremendously that we had the support of the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and my very excellent teammate and collaborator, Stuart Elliott, the Director of the Office of Veteran Services. So, actually, I believe I would have been another three or four years working my way through the website or something of that one. So here we are, and the big for both of those. Um, and I would also like to thank our co-sponsors tonight, Tom Zeidler and the International Affairs Program. There he is. John Griffin and the Conference on World Affairs. Um, and Tom Reese from the American Music Research Center. He is traveling and decided not to be here. And Mark Pittenger and Billia Holden of the Department of History. And you are I would like to return to how essential it was to have the support of the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. And it is a knowledge I would never abuse. But now I know if you have something important you want to do and your spirit is broken by the entanglement of what you're going to have to do with Washington, D.C., let's not overburden her, but this is the person you need to be in touch with. So, uh, I shouldn't have said that because now they're all going to come out. <laughs> but this is our Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, the excellent Christine Gonzalez. everyone. I'm really honored to be here. Actually, Stu and Patty don't know this, but um, I'm very aware of um, the Morense Nani. Um, I grew up in New Mexico and in Gregg County, which is a copper mining community. And often our families, um, if there were strikes or other things with the unions, our families might go help in Morense and Morense might go help in Grand County um, to hold the picket lines and different things. So actually, um, when I saw that this was coming, I had told my assistant I really want to try to get to that program because it's just, um, our families would actually talk about the veterans um, from Morense, and we had quite a few. And for being in a Hispanic communities uh, that were small rural communities, uh, serving the nation was very important, and we had an extraordinary number of not only Vietnam veterans, but World War II veterans, and so it's just, it's it's more meaningful for me in different ways um, to be able to be here tonight around this, and uh, my community would be very surprised and very thankful that something has been written about such a small rural community that people don't know very much about. So thank you. My great pleasure. Um, I do have to thank Patty Limerick because she's just been an amazing partner uh, and we love working with Patty and she brought up, hey, we need to do something on our campus at CU Boulder. You know, we need to think about our veterans and of course we do. Um, and how best can we do that? And Patty really just brought us all the information we just needed to make things happen. So thank you, Patty. I really appreciate working with you. And we appreciate the support of the Center for the American National Disability. This, this is just an amazing partnership. 
Um, I also want to give a sp special um, note of thanks to our Student Veteran Association and the President is here tonight. So he's always at all of the events um, and a great supporter of all of our students on campus. I'd also like to thank Stu Elliott and our Office of Veteran Services who not only helps our student veterans but also their dependents who might want to use um, any of the tuition dollars and all that that's afforded to them. I would also like to take this um, opportunity to personally thank all of the armed forces and their families that have served in Vietnam. And we're highly honored to be part of, um, of this program. Um, and any family members that are here tonight, too, we're also grateful for you. I'd like to thank all of you for coming to see Boulder. Um, I think it's great that we're a commemoration partner, and there's not a ton of campuses that are, and we look forward to any future events on campus and with all of you. So thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I should mention that we have, um, we have just buttons and, and uh, stamps, or seals, seals that if people would like those who are not veterans, it would be great if you just want to show your engagement with the commemoration, that would be wonderful too. So I'm just getting such a strong sense that if I go through this whole introduction, our speaker is not the kind of person who wants to just stand there while I introduce him. So I don't know what to do here. Uh, so I will do this briefly. Kind of briefly is fine. Except that your achievements are not brief. This is a big problem. <laughs> you have messed me up here because you have too many achievements. So, well, no, I'm, uh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Kyle Longley is the Snell Family Dean's Distinguished Professor at Arizona State University in the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, as well as the School of Politics and Global Studies, which adds up to a kind of triple, or more exactly quintuple, crown of academic disciplines. Really, covering all those bases, good uh, The courses he teaches reflect the same wide-ranging expertise and curiosity. They include modern U.S. foreign relations, the United States and Latin America, the American experience in Vietnam, U.S. military history, America as a global superpower, and the American cinema during the Cold War. He is also a team taught in classes on American literature and the Holocaust and on war, culture, and memory. He has written a bunch of books. This is an abbreviation. I, I'll take the abbreviation. Okay. A bunch. I can pass this around. But you can all <laughs> see that. Uh, and you should look at them all. But you should particularly look at the one that you will be hearing about tonight, the one that uh, Vice Chancellor Gonzalez has already spoken of. I've been mispronouncing this for weeks now. The Lorenzi Marines, uh, a, t a tale of small town America. I will note very briefly a few facts. First, the men that Kyle writes about in this book were born only three years before me, and the era of that military of their military service is very immediate to me. Second, with its portrait of an important Western American town, this book, better than anything I can imagine, unites the work of our Senate American West with the Vietnam War commemoration. And third, reading Kyle's book and now being in his company has reaffirmed every reason I've ever had to appreciate the character, the determination, and the work of my fellow historians. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Well, it's great to be here tonight, and if you have any problem hearing me, just raise your hand. That's not normally going to be the case. Uh, I have to admit, I was raised the son of a Texas football coach. <laughs> and my mother worked in the Baptist church, so you can guess what my influences were. But I'm here tonight, and where I want to start, I want you to close your eyes. Everyone close your eyes. I want you to pick and put on each side of you four of your best friends. Four on one side, four on the other. Visualize who that is. Hold those images in your head. I'm going to ask you to think about it a little later. But tonight's story is one of a small town in Arizona. That story will be, I think, replicated across the country during the Vietnam War. And the name of the book is The Marinci Marines, and I know many of you have already read it in terms of your book club, but I really want you to think about this. 
First of all, location is extremely important. Just to sort of give you a, many of you have been to along the I-10 going from beautiful Las Cruces over to Tucson. And this sort of gives you, and you can see the larger map up to the top. This uh, 191 is Safford, and then you go to Marinci Clifton. Marinci is the second largest open bit copper mine in the world. It is a massive undertaking. I'll give you some pictures in a moment. But just to give you, it's right on the uh, Arizona-New Mexico border, as the, uh, the Chancellor was pointing out. These communities are very interrelated, whether it be Ajo, whether it be Douglas, whether it be Bisbee. They're throughout the state of Arizona. The 191 actually during the day of the time of these young men is named the 666. They changed that letter for the obvious reasons. But it's a mining town, a mining camp. It's not even a town. The Phelps Dodge Company, which today has been bought out by Freeport McMoran, the Australian company, controlled the town. I love this picture, and you sort of get that it was built into the hillsides. And I want you to keep in mind some of these pictures that I've given you here. I take a quote from an Irish priest in 1962, and they always had an Irish priest because there's a large Catholic community, mainly among the Mexican-American community. He comes out of his house and walked and wrote to his mom on the first day. And he writes his mom, quote, I'm in a shanty in an old shanty town. Keep in mind, this town is completely controlled by the company. The company owns the housing. It owns the schools. It owns the police force. It is the cable company, the electric company. They have company stores. You don't live there without the permission of the company. You still don't even today. So it's a unique setting. And through 1969, the company segregated the town, mainly to try to keep the labor from uniting, because there's always going to be strikes. There's going to be a lot of labor unrest. And as it happens throughout the region, this is going to be very periodic, and they're oftentimes going to work together. So keep in mind, this is a unique setting. Here's another famous picture. And you can see the smelter which was always billowing. And so this is looking south. And this is the town. Again, the football field is a very unique football field in that you could not kick a, a field goal or an extra point at the south end because at the south end there was a 100-foot cliff. So if you kicked it, you were going to have to chase a ball down a 100-foot cliff. So everybody kicked it one end. But it was built on an old slug heap. And so, again, contextualizing that this is a company town, the demographics are very Western, I would argue, in that it's about 50% Hispanic, about 45% Anglo, and about 5% Native American. There was one African American thing, but that was not a very common process. So again, I was raised in Andrews, Texas, in West Texas, and that was a very similar demographic to what I was raised in, so it was an oil town rather than a copper mining town. So this is a very Western story, I would argue. So here's the story. It's March 1966. And Miss Helen Arnold, the English teacher, is in class. And she has a, a large number of these young men that I'll, I'll, I'll go over in just a little bit more in more detail. And she suddenly announces a pop quiz. Groans start taking place. So say, all, right. <laughs> all right, I can keep talking even in the dark, you know. But she announces a pop quiz. About the same time, a high school principal shows up and says, anyone wanting to go meet with the Marine recruiter can get out of the pop quiz. <laughs> they run over each other trying to get out the door to go meet with the Marine recruiter. And you have a cross section. These are all the sons. And ultimately, the sergeant had come over from Globe, Arizona, about a two-hour drive. And he walks in, and what my uh, people have told me, what it strikes them as, many of you have probably seen the movie Born on the Fourth of July, where the sergeant comes down and just really impresses them with the stories. And these young men, only one actually was seen as college material, maybe two. So they knew they had two choices. They could go work in the mines where you would work in this day and time, 26 days on, two days off. That was their contract. Or, 
as he promised, we could see the world. Keep in mind, it's 66. Vietnam's heating up, but it's not the Vietnam that we'll see in 67, 68. So they're not as worried. But again, they're a cross-section. The only one who had been off to college was Stan King up in the top left-hand corner. And while he was there, he went off to the University of Arizona, which is hard for me to say uh, for the obvious reasons. But he'd been down there studying engineering, but he'd really not done very well. He also had a girl turn down his marriage proposal. So he's just sort of searching for something. But the other eight sort of got together. They played football together. They'd been friends forever. And before the Marine recruiter finished his day in Marinzi, he had nine recruits. Eight out of the same high school class. Three are Mexican-American. Five are Anglo. And Joe Sorrelman, down to the bottom left, is Navajo. His uncles had been code talkers during World War II. He's the youngest of his family. So again, a cross-section of the community. But again, this is a community that would track young men starting from about the third grade and push them toward technical skills or typically the mine owners and many Anglos would get pushed towards college. That was just the way the community worked. And that was replicated throughout the Southwest. But they'd already sort of been moving there. But again, they knew the draft was going to get them one way or the other. So the argument was, well, we're going to go, let's go with the Marine Corps. They're the toughest, they're the baddest, and they fit into a mindset. And here you see the all-state linebacker in the middle with this letter jacket on, talking to an Army recruiter, and this was in the annual. So I use it as sort of, you know, they were setting, even within the annual, that they were already thinking about this. Mike Cranford, one of the young men, summed up the feelings of friends, of his friends very well. He quote said, we were small-town people. We still believed in mom and apple pie. It was part of my, du our, our, my duty as a man growing up to join the service. They didn't have to draft us. It was part of what we were supposed to do. And those of you that have read the book know I heavily influence or heavily emphasize issues like Latino and being Latino and the expectation you had to prove your Americanness. I also talk about social constructions of masculinity and the expect expectations of these young working class men that this was what they were supposed to do, just like their fathers did in World War II. There are many levels to this that I uh, talk about, but it is, it's almost like they're being pushed forward and they don't know what else to do. They don't really have that many options. So they join the Marine Corps. They have to wait, they, they signed up in March of 1966, but they have to wait until July 4, 1966, they had the boot camp. And they ultimately had to San Diego to be Hollywood Marines, to borrow the term that those uh, on the East Coast that went to Paris Island would characterize the Marines of the West. <laughs> and they joined training platoon, and they stayed together, and they promised, been promised that in platoon 1055. So they get there on July 5th. But again, July 4th, instead of waking up to be like most of the families in the community, going out to see the fireworks, going out to have a nice holiday, they're getting on a bus and going to San Diego. And of course, the boot camp experience is very similar to what many experience throughout the country during this time. They get run right onto the yellow footprints. They're very little in front, very little behind. Feet out. The drill sergeants, and you see in the middle here, Sergeant Bowser, six foot five, two hundred and forty pounds. <laughs> He questioned their sexuality. He questioned their mother. They questioned all elements of their lives. So for eight weeks, they're going to endure boot camp together. And it's good being together. At night, they'd read letters from home. they try to help get through. They'd help each other. Bobby Del Draper, the one that I said, the all-state linebacker, on the long training runs. Somebody had to pick up his pack because he just didn't do well under that heavy, long-distance running where so many of the other young men were much smaller. And another case, Van Whitmer, one of the others, cut through the line of another unit for dinner, and you can and a melee proceeded, and his friends came to his aid. So they stick together, and they do well. 
Because these are young men, again, the Marine recruiters knew exactly where they were going. These are young men that can hunt. Hard-nosed football players, many of them. They talk about when they were young, they played on the dirt and gravel, play foot tackle football, and they'd use cardboard uh, for their knee pads and their shoulder pads. Again, these are tough, hard-nosed kids who know hard work. Again, skilled riflemen. But I love this. This is a very poignant quote from one of the more robust characters in the book. And this is Clive Garcia right in the middle. Clive wrote home, quote, they walk us harder than the average college student. But there's a reason. We are learning how to kill while the college student is learning how to live. I think that's so poignant. Well, they graduate in September of 1966. You see here Clive Garcia and Rubble Mokayo off to the left. All the group is over with the exception of Van Whitmer, who had run off to see his girlfriend, uh, is standing together as a group. So after eight weeks, they graduate. They get three weeks of AIT, advanced infantry training, and then they start shipping out to Vietnam. So they graduate in May, and by December of 1966, four are already on their way to Vietnam. Leroy Cisneros, Bobby Draper, Larry West, and Joe Sorrell. This is their ship. They got a bargain basement cruise of the Pacific on the General Gaffney. Some of you may have actually taken that. It was a big troop ship, thousands of Marines and some sailors piled onto a ship that when they get to Okinawa, they give them shore leave. That shore leave does not go well because they all get in fights. And half of them come back with broken arms and broken noses. And, you know, there was a little alcohol in by, you know, taken in. But, and they'd been stuck on the ship for two weeks. Not a good thing to do. The commander uh, regretted giving them that. But one of the interesting ones is of the first ones is Leroy Cisneros. On about two days out from Da Nang, where they were landing, he got his orders. They were recon. Those in the Marine Corps, those that know anything about the Marine Corps, knows that's about as tough a duty as you can draw. He had no training in recon. He had eight weeks of boot camp and three weeks of advanced infantry training. And they say his face is flushed. It was like a death knell. And here you see, Leroy gets there, and much like these Marines and kids, they wanted to prove themselves. Here he is in the bush. And if you're not familiar with what recon is, they go out into the middle of the enemy territory with five to seven young men, or five to seven people, trying to find where the enemy were so that they could either call in artillery strikes or they could call in larger company operations. So think you're right in the middle of the enemy, five to seven of you, and terrified. Well, not only does he join recon, he can't resist after a couple of missions taking over his point. Having to lead the group through the areas. And in a number of occasions, he almost dies. One case, they let him walk by, the point man did, these uh, Viet Cong let him walk by and then launch the ambush. And all he could think was fall to the ground and hope that the rest of the unit would come up toward him. And he could hear grenades landing and he'd roll. And then he'd hear another one. He'd roll. And all the time he was saying, God, if you will get me out of this, I'll go to church every Sunday. <laughs> he also said he, a lot of times when he got into situations like that, he'd cry out to his mom and dad. Well, he got out. And no, he did not go to church every Sunday. <laughs> but he was praying. Now. And again, here you see in the bush, leading his group through. He will survive 43 missions in recon. Pretty remarkable feat in its own right. He will see friends killed. He'll see his beloved lieutenant bleed out in his arms. But he makes it. Another miraculous story is that of Joe Sorrelman, the one I was telling you was a Navajo who's 
father or, or whose uncles were coat toppers. Uncles and, uh, had served in World War II. In Joe's case, Joe, instead of like Leroy who opened his orders and said, oh man, I got the death sentence. Joe opened his and he got the best duty he possibly could, guarding an air base at Chulai, where by this point there was very little enemy activity against the air base. Now there had been heavy fighting in Chulai area in 1965 and uh, earlier in 66. But here's what, he got bored and said, I want to see combat. I want to see the real stuff. So he kept putting in requests. Send me to the fighting. Here's a lesson for anybody going in the Marine Corps. Maybe those that are already served. Ask and you shall receive. But as Joe will say, I wish I would not have made that request. Because where he ends up is, they send him to Kantian. In the summer of 1967, where some of the heaviest fighting of the war is ongoing. Joins a rival company. He goes from a very cushy duty where he lived in a tent, had hot meals each and every day, to out in the bush for weeks at a time, searching for the NBA. And these are battle-hardened NBA. These are not VC anymore. These are NBA fighting across the DMZ. The story is miraculous in this way. He, barely, he always gets killed a couple of times in a number of ambushes. And sometimes this is laughable. He carried the M79 grenade launcher. And one day, his... Uh, lieutenant ordered him to fire on a sniper that was outside the perimeter. And he fired it, but he forgot to take out all his cleaning rags. So the rags just pull up in the air. So it was quite the sight. He hated the artillery attacks. So much so that he oftentimes, when they came in, he'd just dive into some and start craw clawing at the uh, earth to his fingers bled. He just terrified. But one day, they've been out on the operation for about two weeks. And they're coming back into base, and the enemy artillery hits on them. So they all jump out of their trucks and get into their ditches. Well, finally, the enemy artillery barrage ends. And so Joe and all his other uh, uh, com comrades come out. And the lieutenant starts taking a roll call to see if make sure nobody got hit. And when he hits Joe Solomon, a chaplain comes running up. And goes, I've been looking for you for weeks. Your brother is really sick. You need to go home. You've got a special need to go home. Originally, Joe was like, well, it's probably a couple of weeks. Whatever's happened has happened. There's a lieutenant pulls him aside and says, you're going to go. The next day, and that night they got hit by NBA. And he goes, maybe it's time to go. So the next morning, he's standing on a landing pad waiting for the helicopters to come in. And the NBA are firing, basically, barrages, trying to take down the helicopters as they come in. So they're coming down hot, hitting, throwing out whatever they have, and just bouncing off. So Joe's standing on the edge of the pad, trying to time it. And then suddenly, here comes one. And he starts running across the pad, trying to time it. And he throws his stuff up into the pad, up into the helicopter, and it's taking off. And he jumps, and he misses. He ends up on the bottom skid. <laughs> and then it's pulling him off, and they had to reach down to pull him off. I have a feeling there was probably some NBA forward observer going, man, that guy wants to get the hell out of here. A few weeks later, after he'd been on leave, checked on his brother up in the Gallup area where his family had moved after uh, leaving Morenci. He sees this guy, Cap Hilton, one of the people he'd served with in Vietnam. The guy goes, you know what happened? Your squad the next day? He says, no, I didn't hear anything. I haven't seen anybody. They ran into an ambush and only once in a while. The Marines wanted to send him back to Vietnam and actually offered him promotions and a variety of things, but he refused. He knew how much he would get. But not everyone was so fortunate. The All-American Kid Bobby Dale Draper, all state basketball, all state football player, good Mormon kid, loved by everybody. Just a wonderful, you know, sort of got that boyish grin that even to the left, he's in the middle of a combat zone, 
and that smile. <coughs> he would serve in a forward, or he would serve in a, a rifle company around Anhoy throughout his tour. He wrote home to his mom and dad about seeing friends of his in, incinerated by an uh, Amtraks that hit a Russian uh, tank mine. And it blew up the napalm that had been in the uh, thing. He also got burned. And what you see over here to the right, so about nine months in, he decides to take his R&R &R and goes to Tokyo. And here he is coming back. Leroy, again, was in recon, working out at Camp Reasoner just outside of the name. So Bobby Dale stops in the scene. It's, early, it's late July, 1967. Leroy... And they start talking. And Bobby goes, well, you know, I'm a couple days late getting back. Leroy's like, aren't you worried? Bobby goes, what are they going to do? Send me to Vietnam? <laughs> they party late into the night. Stinking drunk, pass out in a trench. And the next day, Leroy's got to go out on a mission. And as he leaves... They talk about the party that they've been playing when they get home. Leroy's last words to him are, don't get killed. Less than a week later, on August 2nd, 1967, Bobby Dell is killed in a Viet Cong ambush. Everyone in the unit is killed, their body stripped, and they're shot in the head for extra to make sure they're dead. Supposedly there were no enemy in the area, and when they called for help, the officer said, you must be exaggerating. There's no more enemy in this area, and I'm sure the lieutenant probably wanted to put up and say, you tell the enemy that they're not here. But they were all killed. And he was killed with 14 or 15 others, and I'm sorry I'm blanking on the exact number, from all from small towns throughout the country. But it was his story. Stan King. He'd originally stayed stateside. And Stan was an interesting character. Six foot five, red headed, freckle face, light complexion, horrible temper, as many as some will say redheads are prone to have, not to group you all in that. But Stan's had avoided, but then in uh, late October, mid to late October 67, he joined the exact company that Bobby Dell had been in before he was killed. He actually got into the Coast Guard Academy and was all set to go to the Coast Guard Academy but failed the I exam. And his mom later asked the Marine recruiter, how can the Coast Guard flunk him out but you guys don't? The recruiter just growled at her, I don't care if he can see straight as long as he shoots straight. Well, he goes out on operation, Essex. He follows alongside 16 others. That same day, his mother pinned. We see all of this. So she had a special relationship with him. Wakes up screaming. She saw Stan go into a hooch and just shot the chest. Of course, her husband says, that could possibly happen. You just had a nightmare. A couple of days later, when the Marine officers show up and she's working in the high school cafeteria and they walk in with her husband, Glenn. She lets out a blood curdling scream. She knows what is happening. Her eldest is dead. These two deaths are very hard on the community. Two in a very short period of time. And keep in mind, while they're fighting in Vietnam at this point, the company has locked out their workers. They're sending their combat pay home to their moms and dads to try to survive the lockout. Anti-war activists probably would have, would have been very vocal in saying, how can you fight for a system that so favors the large company over your family, and you're fighting and dying in Vietnam? And have you send your combat pay home to, in, in opposition to this multi-million dollar company? But they are locked out. But it doesn't stop. Tet Offensive comes along. January 1968. Those are in your U.S. history class, and I see students here. The Tet Offensive in late January 1968 initiates a heavy fighting in Vietnam. 
A lot of Americans die, and they have to be replaced. Dan Whitmer. He'd originally stayed stateside also. And I should have made the point, Stan was only in country 18 days before he's killed. Van gets there. He's an engineer working near Hue, where some of the heaviest fighting of the Tet Offensive occurs. And one day he's out, and he's shot by an enemy a sniper in the head. Result, and this is the official listening, result, gunshot wound to the head from a hostile rifle fire. He'd been in country six weeks. Three are now gone. Larry West. Larry was the ultimate, and I know you guys here at the University of Colorado will appreciate this. He was a kicker. Maybe that's for us older people, but many of you know what I mean by kicker. The cowboy. Loved horses. Sort of had the James Dean attitude, I don't really give a crap. Never could get his buttons straight. But he had gone over in that first group with the General Gaffney and actually been near Kantian and had survived. He wrote home a letter talking about the time he first killed somebody. A PC ran, ran into some grass, and then came out the other side, and he shot him. So he was like shooting a deer. But he survived his first tour, got home in January of 1968. Did not adjust well to garrison duty. One day, again, he couldn't get his buttons straight. He was not the consummate Marine as far as spitting polish. One day he's off base and he forgot to wear his belt. So the MPs arrested him, took him back to base. And he, at that point, he just said, screw this nonsense. I'm going back to where I think I can make a difference. So he heads back to Vietnam on his second tour. But before he leaves, he sees the local football coach, Aaron Friedman, who is now the most winningest coach in Arizona football history. He saw Coach Friedman at the bowling alley, the bowling alley owned by the company. And as he went to say bye, he says, it's been nice knowing you. Coach goes, no, 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 don't talk about that. He goes, Coach, I came close the first time around. I know I'm not going to make a mistake. Bobby Dillon had said something to the same one. Stan had offered to marry a girl, saying, well, when I die, you can have my death benefits. They had these premonitions. And unfortunately, on May 17th, just outside of Goinoy Island, they walked into an ambush. And this is the official Marine Corps drawing of what the leveling were, and those little X's are where American soldiers died. He's one of those X's. Again, his brother had died a few years earlier in a rifle, or a hunting accident. The only child left. He could have avoided it, but he chose to go back. Four now. Robert Mukaya also got up, got caught up in the manpower drain of the Tet Offensive. Robert got the best job of everybody out of boot camp and AIT. They sent him to Hawaii, and because he loved horses, they let him be the horse wrangler for the horses that the officers and the officers' wives and kids would ride along the beach. <laughs> I mean, what a dude. <laughs> He also was extremely handsome. They all called him a ladies' man. Everybody loved Rob. He was probably the least likely to have been perceived of as a Marine. Sweet, heartfelt, and again, handsome. For the older generation, you'll get this. I always say he looked like sort of a cross between Ricardo Bottomon and Tyrone Powell. That's not a bad thing, right? I see that. <laughs> He also started dating this really wealthy woman who would take him to all the concerts. And in fact, they gave him a going away party on their family yacht. So again, he always did well there. He arrives at Quezon in June of 1968. With the heaviest fighting of, some of the heaviest fighting of the wars that he was. On June 18th, they go out. And the NVA had waited on them. They set up their camp for the night. The NVA's waiting. And they overrun. Somewhere along the line, his company's or his platoon is ordered from one side of the camp to the other. And in the heavy fighting, he shot the back. 
he dies. He been in country 18 days. He wrote letters back talking about how scared he was. How he feared for his life. Five out of nine now. Keep in mind, the Vietnam War typically only required, uh, the chance of getting killed was about 7%. Here we already have 55% of a group dead. This is extremely important. That leaves only one man left. Mike Cranford goes and survives. He's on, he, his worst wound is he struck. He was a RTL. But he makes it and gets back. And then first thing he does when he gets back, he was the only one married also. Goes up, flies over to Las Vegas, buys him a new uh, Chevy Chevelle, drives it back to the and they let him out a day or uh, uh, three months early. And as he leaves the uh, Marine base, the only thing he does is in his red Chevy uh, Chevelle, flips the bird to all the guards. <laughs> That's Mike. And we're going to introduce Mike. At least Clive Garcia. Clive was, if Robert was the least likely to be a Marine, Clive was the most likely. Five foot ten, 195 pound, mean as a snake when he needed to be. But instead of going to Vietnam, he's originally sent to Guam, which just pisses him off. He wants to be in the fighting. And so here he is, he, he rises up, he's the one in front, the corporal, and he's an MP. And then eventually he comes back stateside to start taking recon. He still wants to go to Vietnam. Well, he's so proficient that they send him the Army Ranger training as a Marine. And that's him down at the bottom. Getting ready to graduate at Fort Benning from Ranger School. Again, he was the consummate Marine. A stereotypical Marine. And he drew a hard duty as he's preparing for Ranger School in that he had to bring Robert's body home. Here he is just outside the family hall in 1968, June of 68. On the back of this picture, that's his mother, Julia. And you can see him smell through the background. He writes, your eyes are swollen. You've cried too much, Mama. Life really itself really isn't that bad. We only have a few sad moments, and all we can do is accept and live with reality. As the Marine Corps starts to withdraw from Vietnam, they finally honor his request to go to Vietnam. And he arrives in August of 1969. Here he is in November of 1969. And I think if you look at the picture, you get a very good view of sort of a thousand yard stare. He'd seen children killed during firefights in between. He'd seen a several of his men blown up. And he's wearing his ranger. Uh, he was very proud of that. But again, thousand yard stare if you look at that. I think it's a very, again, poignant is a word that I like to use in describing this. Just after Thanksgiving in 1969, he tries to defuse a booby trap and it's blown up. This is a funeral. Ironically, the church where he's buried, as well as three of the others, is being torn down because the mine is swallowing the town. They actually have to cover the church windows with plastic. You get the cold wind from going. This is December of 1969. That's his uh, a younger sister, who he left the life insurance policy to, so that she could be able to go to college. He also had gotten engaged. I was scheduled to be married. This is his mother, Julia, and that's his fiancée, Susie, to the right. The father, who was a World War II veteran, Bushmasters. She will rise, Julia will, and stand over and say, Thank you for being my son, my son. Oh, my dear boy, thank you so much. People ask by this sixth death, why aren't they saying enough is enough? Hasn't this town given enough for the cause? There are many towns that are not making any sacrifices. Why does this one have to bear so much? And you remember that I showed the picture of Clive. Well, this 
The one with the flowers to just right on its left hand side, that's Robert's gravesite. And then Clyde's will be laid right next to it. I'm sure he didn't envision when he stood there in June of 1968, he would join him in its way. But now they are forever. ABC News comes. Time Magazine. Because they're asking that question. Why this community? And why aren't they up in arms against the war? And they are. In fact, they're asking the question, why aren't we winning? If we're going to make these sacrifices, we want to win. And there's this great quote from an Arizona Republic reporter covering this. And I think this is, again, a very good one. Larry's West mom did start to say, I don't know what the president would say now about it, but I think the Marinci boys, now in Vietnam, should come home if they want to. It doesn't seem right that a small town should give so much. But the journalist concluded, quote, Men who have spent a lifetime of working 26 days before getting two days off are not devoid of emotion or inured to tragedy, but they have learned to cope with setbacks better than most of us. You remember that first picture I showed you of the town? This is it now. The town where they live is buried. They tried to blow up the high school, but it had been designed as a bomb shelter, and they couldn't find enough uh, material to blow it up, so they just buried it. You remember that first one? That's this now. And it continues to expand. There's another one. Just to give you the enormity. So not only have they lost their friends, they've lost their town. And Leroy Cisneros, the recon, makes a very good point. He asks this question. And tells a reporter, I don't want them to be forgotten because they sacrificed their lives. Those guys have been dead for 30 years, but not in my mind. I want to know my kid, or want my kids to know at least that Bobby Draper, their dad's best friend, died in Vietnam. But juxtapose this against the next. Remember what I read you about Mike saying it was apple pie and our duty? This is from the 90s. The 90s. <coughs> Look how it's changed. Vietnam was a war, middle, lower middle class war. If you had money, you went to college. I didn't go because I wanted to. I went because I was too stupid to know that. And if you look at him, he's suffering from undiagnosed PTSD in this picture. He will not get treatment for his PTSD until 2005. If you look at that tattoo across the top, and that is a tattoo. That's not ink or anything. Well, it is ink. Permanent. It's A-M-I-I-G-F. What he wanted you to do was ask me what it meant. It meant, ask me if I give them. I'll let you fill in the lines. He started getting tattoos of crosses on his arm with his six dead friends. He didn't finish. Because as soon as he got diagnosed, less than a year later, he died of a massive coronary. But look at what he says at the bottom. And this ties to his PTSD. I felt guilty I came home. I never saw the Kings. I found myself avoiding the Garcias. I never talked to Bobby's dad. At one point, he had to work with Larry's dad. Again, the survivor's death, which is a very strong and powerful force. But for a long time, he said, well, you know, I can't admit that I have PTSD because that would be admitting I'm not a strong enough man. I'm weak. So 40 years, he ignores it. But when he finally does get diagnosed, the VA hospital in Tucson says it's one of the worst cases they've ever seen. 40 years ago. Well, they are remembered. Partly with my book, partly in a number of other ways. You can go visit there uh, at the Vietnam Memorial. This is where you'll find their names. Jose Macayo, Robert. Here's a particularly poignant story, though, of how the families have to deal with it. Because not only do they lose their sons, they lose their brothers. They lose friends. And this is Kathleen Garcia. You remember the little girl that I showed you in the funeral? This is her grown up. And in June of 1968, or 86, she went the first time to the wall. 
And here's what she says. She took a long walk down. And as she gets close, and she passes the other panels as she's hitting the Clive's name, she says, quote, all the names get flooding her mind. Then she stopped in front of 16W where Clive's name was. Quote, then my eyes locked on his name and my knees buckled a little. And the sobbing was uncontrollable. Lots of people were all around, but I didn't care. I squatted down and I rubbed my finger over his knee. Ultimately, she takes the etching, and as she strides, I strides away. All that she can think is all those names. All those names. There have been efforts to memorialize the Marinci Nine, including one just outside the high school. The high school that they went is no longer there. So they built a new one. And then in 1998, they put a memorial just right by the flagpole so that everyone entering the high school would have to pass by that day. I don't think that's any small coincidence. Given the community's dedication to sending more and more people as part of their national service into the military. There are others. One of my favorite is this. It's on a huge bluff just outside of Clifton, Arizona, called Mars Bluff. And underneath those, those are all the flags of the military. And in the back, a little bit of ways, is a Bible in a box and has the, uh, oh, is it Matthew? And I'm blanking right now. But basically, greater, uh, greater, no greater sacrifice can be made than that for your. Underneath a line are documents. The first six to the left of the emergency six that died. Here's where the story, I think, is extremely important just to contextualize. This is my, one of my favorite guys in the world, a guy named Steve Guzzo, Vietnam veteran, infantry, army, from Cliff, not Marinci. And Steve brings up a really good point. He says, what brought home the sacrifice of the Vietnam veterans? What made the impact was the Marinci 9. But he also makes the point, we can't forget our other people. And I think that's a very powerful point to be made. So this story has been remembered in my book. It was just featured in a wonderful PBS documentary called On Two Fronts about Latinos in Vietnam. I recommend highly if you really want to get some very strong visuals of the area. Clyde Garcia's brother Danny is interviewed. Very powerful. Outstanding. Outstanding, and you'll see my ugly mug also. But I also incorporate it into other things. I actually started the Marinci book and realized I didn't understand the big story. So I went back and wrote another one called Grunts, the American Combat Soldier of Vietnam, which one reviewer called a monument to the Vietnam veteran. So it is an important story. Unique characteristics, yes. Were these stories replicated across the country? Absolutely. So, in conclusion, close your eyes. Now choose six of your friends and block them out. Choose six. That's what Clyde. That's what mine, and that's what Joe is saying. Thank you very much. I know that went a little long, so please forgive me. It's just sometimes I get caught up in it. But I will take questions, and I know people may have to go places, so I will not be insulted if you have to take off. Uh, but I will take questions. Either I did a great job or... Could you tell us about the 50th anniversary of the class? Yes, recently in June of 1960, uh, the class of 1966 had their class meeting. They shared it with Clifton because the numbers are decreasing. And they are very interrelated. Clifton is just a little town just that's not part of the mine, but is, is related to the mine. 
Uh, and so they asked me to come speak. And what was amazing, uh, and what uh, Dr. Limerick was making a point about, is I gave a presentation. I only kept it about 15, 20 minutes. A lot of the Clifton people didn't know it, or people who had left didn't know it. But there wasn't a dry eye in it. And I'm about 200 people. But what was especially poignant was Joe Sorlin, the only one who's still alive. Leroy Cisneros died of a very rare kidney disease. The military blamed it on the company for which he worked. The company said he got it in Vietnam, so he was basically screwed. But what happened was, after I finished my presentation, they brought up family members and friends to put up one single rose, white rose, all fun. And as they did it, Joe rang a little bell, just a note. Don't forget, the class of 66 does not have people here. They never aged beyond the age of 19 and 20. There are a lot of classes at 66 and 67 this year. They're going to have that happen. Thomas Edison High School in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 54 kids out of one high school class. A working class, predominantly Latino, African American community. So this is happening across the country. We're coming up on commemorations of 50 years. But there are towns that have been affected in the Iraq Afghanistan. There's some in California, there's one high school in Tucson, Mountain View that's already lost like six kids, seven kids. Of course, it's a much bigger place. But that's a heavy loss. And again, when I ask you to close your eyes and eliminate six of your friends, think about that. Sure, Normandy with that. Others. Yes, ma'am. Phelps Dodge. Now, Phelps Dodge had a notorious repu uh, reputation for their uh, bad treatment of their workers. Again, you want to work 26 days on, two days off? I don't know anybody. There's a horrible strike in 46. There's a horrible strike in all throughout the century. Again, their parents are locked out by the company while they're fighting in Vietnam. There will be a horrible strike in 83 where the National Guard is called in. And the union's broken. A lot of these people just leave. Why are your parents locked out? Because they didn't agree to the contract. And so the company, you know, there would either be a strike or the company was, responds first and wants them out. So the company chose. And Phelps Dodge was, again, the choice. But what happened in 67, 68 is other towns and others throughout the country, including New Jersey, any uh, the unions worked together, but it took them almost 14 months before they did the start. Yeah, yeah, they came from uh, United uh, Auto Workers. Even there was a number of groups. Other questions? Yes, sir. For, for all of the parents of the Marines in early in April, the question was: Did uh, all the parents and people within the family uh, talk to me? The West family had passed. Um, the Whitmer family was not very, they passed, and the others were not really willing. The West family, the only way I got much information on uh, Larry is somebody tried to write the book early, and the families threw a fit. But he got some of the letters from Larry, and he gave them to her. But no, not all wanted to talk. The Garcia family, who ended up being one of my strongest supporters, originally did not want it done. But uh, they ultimately relented. After the, I gave a presentation, and Mama Garcia, Julia, rose and said, I think God has sent you here to write this story. And then they turned over everything. But it, it was not an easy road to help. Uh, these are small town people. They're very suspicious of outsiders. Being a PhD didn't help the process. Uh, Fortunately, though, for me, as I noted earlier, I was raised in a small oil town, very similar demographics, and that helped. I, I joked earlier today uh, at, at the presentation, had I shown up like my dean of humanities at ASU in my bow tie and with, you know, the, uh, show, uh, the elbow protectors, they would have run me out of town in probably 45 seconds or less. <laughs> my only weakness was two. One is... Um, I wasn't from there, but I did understand communities like that. 
But the biggest weakness was I drove a Toyota Tacoma rather than a Ford or Chevy. Mm -hmm. I had to overcome that. But one of the things that won me a lot of respect was I was a son of a Texas football coach who played West Texas football. So that mean I was that meant I was tough and you know had some of the things that they respected. And ultimately I did, but I worked on this book for almost um, 13 years. Now, I wrote three other books in between, but I worked for 13 years. I'd wake up in the morning thinking about this. I'd go to sleep thinking about this. I said a lot of prayers to God saying, please let me get this right. And I've been very blessed from the community and from people who have read it. They said, thank you for doing this. Thank you for writing grunts, too, because it addresses many of the stereotypes of the Vietnam veteran. And really it says, that's crap, that's crap, that's crap. And again, it is characterized as a monument to Vietnam, which is about as good a review as I could possibly do. That's a wonderful question. It was not an easy. When I wrote a biography of Senator Albert Gore Sr., the anti war senator from Tennessee, that was an easy book to write. There's 2,100 folders in his archive in Middle Tennessee State. This one was a piece here, a piece there, oral history here. But I. How, if you had asked me in 2000 I could, if I could get 330 pages together, I would have said, no way, no how. But ultimately, the door was open. Excellent question. Others? Yes, ma'am. How would the war have been different if it was as you would postulate, either more or both, more spread out as far as people being affected and killed um, versus? Being, um, having an upper class town and a bunch of people in the upper class killed. Like. I'll, well, I'll, I'll give you, I'm, right, I'm finishing a book right now, and uh, we'll be in press in January on LBJ. And it just talks about the one year in 1968. But I know from my studies of LBJ, LBJ knew what would happen. That's why he didn't really call up the reserves. He rarely saw a National Guard unit being activated to go to Vietnam. Because the National Guard units by 1966 and 67 were being populated by members of the Dallas Cowboys, the Baltimore Colts, George W. Bush, you name it. Uh, they either got deferments or they were put into these areas. And they knew, they called those guys up. Johnson Warren, he says, I will lose all support if those are the guys that have to go. He knew exactly what was going to happen. So, yeah, it would have changed the dynamic uh, very quickly. You know, I, 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 I'll jokingly say this on behalf of it. I want a new constitutional amendment. It says the first people that have to go into combat are the president, his family, his cabinet's kids and his family, the Congress's families, members of any uh, milit uh, defense industries, families that are at a certain level. How many wars would we fight that for? Are they being much more limited? So, no, your question is an excellent one. Now, some people have argued that there were middle class, and I would argue the changes in the demographics in Vietnam occur in 1967 when they do away with the deferments for the graduate school, and then when the lottery system goes in, it does change some of the dynamics. But keep in mind, too, a lot of these uh, Vietnam veterans, they volunteer, especially in the early stages. Uh, and, and they volunteered to leave places like Germany. As the war escalated and as these changes took place, you know, there's two different really wars, I argue, in Grunt. There's the war to 1968, which has a very different attitude and a, a, a feeling. The one after 1968, after Tet, is very different. Excellent question. Other questions? Yes, sir. What is the <coughs> comment about the, uh, the, the change in the draft and bringing the lottery? There's a great deal of it. And um, I remember that when the, the debate about uh, going to a lot of the system, um, one of the, one of the, one of the uh, great arguments is that people will hold hope that the professional military is going to have people who basically come from the lower socioeconomic classes. And this is a way to, uh, this is a means of, you know, we all be, we, 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 we not have to 
um, go in. And um, there's a great debate about this, but eventually they did bring in the uh, the all of the military to great extent that has that has been much now. Yeah, no, that is very true. I've got stories in grants. I talked a little bit more about it in greater detail in grants, the draft. You know the system is going to be skewed in Louisiana when the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan is running the largest draft for in Louisiana. Globe, Arizona. What they do is they take the annual, the lady that ran it, and she, as they were graduating, she just goes, this one's good, this one's good. The dominant Mexican America. And all 67 does change it to a degree. And the other part I make a point in grunts is a lot of these people were sort of like these young men. They were drafted this. They knew they were going to get drafted. So they tried to make a conscious decision which way they were going. A lot of people chose the Air Force because they didn't want to be a, a grunt. A lot of people chose the Navy because at least they were going to get three squares a day, uh, be on a boat, sleep not in a month. Now, some of them didn't anticipate becoming medics, but were in court. But there was a general, oftentimes, a choice. You know, by uh, 67, one third are being drafted, about one third admit to be drafted boost. The others are bummed. So it's a system that's fundamentally skewed by this point. And again, you add in the National Guard and you add in the reserves, and the way that those were being cherry picked again uh, and saved for. You know, there's a great picture in Life magazine in 1968 of the head of the uh, draft board in Maryland standing with uh, like seven of the Baltimore Colts that were part of his National Guard team. Mm -hmm. you know, and the draft of age. I mean, my favorite one of the stories is Jack Kent, who got a draft exemption for his knee, even though he continued to play in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> So, I talk much more about that in grunts than I do in this book, because again, these guys are volunteer, but again, they knew they were going to get drafted, they didn't have the college option, and then they just wanted to change. Now, many people chose to go the route of, I want to go to get a skill, I don't want to be in the combat. These guys went the opposite way, knowing the Marine Corps is probably going to make them all three away. Outstanding. Outstanding question. Any others? Students? Yes, sir. Only one is still alive. One died of a kidney, a rare kidney disease. That was the one I was saying. The military blamed on the company. The company blamed on the military. That somehow he picked it up along the way. He died at a very early. I mean, he died like 58. Which to me now, as I get older, seems very young. <laughs> you know, it's a it perspective. But only one is alive, and you will see Joe. There were, actually, if you go and look in late, late July on the Arizona Republic, they did a full page. Front page story on Jeff. He was disarmed by the Harlem Globetrotters, actually. Mm -hmm. And if you go to one of the uh, West Valley uh, casinos, he's a security person. So you can find Joe. I love Joe uh, on so many levels. But uh, he, you know, I, I have really fallen in love with the community and just people as a whole. And that's the great thing about studying modern history. You get to know a lot of very interesting people. Very interesting. But that's a great question. But again, only one lot lives. And that's why he was playing a, a ring in the bell at their um, reunion, because he's the only one So, uh, excellent. Any other students? Yes, ma'am. Um, is it still a completely company town? Yes, ma'am. They do have a supermarket there now that is not a company store. You can own businesses in the town, but you rent. So there is a actually a pretty good little Chinese food place. You wouldn't think the rents here is only the Chinese food. Place. That's pretty good. What's the population? Right now, about six thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, three years ago, it was eight thousand. But when the copper was three dollars a pound, mm -hmm. three thirty a pound, now it's back down about two dollars a pound. That's where it fluctuates. Sure. In uh, the first Persian Gulf War, there was actually significant representation from the mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. And the Iraq Afghanistan wars are one of because. Uh, copper prices were high, jobs were plentiful, mm -hmm. and it's a you know you get it's not a bad job compared to what's available around. Again, you can be fired at any moment, you can be kicked out of your house at any moment, uh, but you trade off some. They provide the hospital, they provide dental care. It's it's an interesting. You know, you're getting chance to go. Mm -hmm. It's well worth it. Yes, ma'am. Did you see how big the town was back then? Five thousand. Yeah, five thousand. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that is a small town. Think of your high school class if you were like them. I think they graduated with 70 kids. Six, five, uh, five girls. It's pretty, pretty bad. No, but here's the question. And here's the question for them. Is this a story of sorrow? Or is this one of pride that they made the ultimate sacrifice for their country? And I leave the story in the book for the people who make their own. I had my own. Um, I was curious, these nine enlisted together at the same time, but over the period of the whole war, were there many others who came from this town? Yes. Okay. Of their high school class, there were like 40 boys and about 29 served. And a lot of them were in airborne, a lot of them were in frontline duties. But they did not. But they, they did serve. This is a community that served. The point was well made in these communities. That's the expectation. Especially after the World War II generation. That is the expectation. And I talk about this in relation to race. There is extra pressure sometimes on the Mexican American community to prove their Americanness. So, yeah, it, 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 a lot served. And that was just a standard. Now, some did, but the majority did. And again, they couldn't escape the draft. One went to UCLA, one of my favorite guys named Oscar Rivea. And he went to UCLA, stood, uh, took off one quarter, thinking, they won't find him. Three weeks later, he had his draft numbers. They found him. I knew exactly what was going on. Well, I better stop there because I can see I've gone. Over my uh, time limit by a few minutes. We started too late, so it was wonderful. And we wanted to do ask everyone to stay for just a, a couple more minutes so we can do the look healthy thing and have Please do. Us in that. But can we just have one? Do you want to say one? No, I just want to say thank you for coming out on a Tuesday evening, especially to the students. I know it's probably for extra credit, but promises of food. <laughs> That's the only way I can get my students to go anywhere. But I do appreciate you, especially coming out. And hopefully uh, this will inspire you to maybe learn a little bit more about Vietnam and the experiences of combat soldiers. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, this is our first round. Uh, you're going to be taking photographs. Okay, so what we would like to do, I'd like to have the Vice Chancellor and Stu, and I think I would like our speaker okay. here. And uh, okay, so there are the pins. We're a little bit new to this, okay? okay. Uh, so you are a, a kind of a uh, handshake. So you see me? I'm standing there. Yeah, and, and then um, I will um, ask each veteran, Vietnam veteran, to come here where I can greet them and say their name, and then they will move along to the line, and each of you will shake hands, and then you have the pin because you also Okay, uh, I should say that this is the Vietnam War commemoration is for Vietnam era veterans. So if you were not in Vietnam, that the commemoration is for Vietnam era. So I see one right there, and I might just ask. Mm -hmm. Did you come? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this, I think I'm going to be pretty well set with names here. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call your attention to my pal, on-time pal, Pete Steinhauer. This is Pete Steinhauer, who served in Vietnam and who wrote with some collaborations here. Uh, not collaborations, but just just sounding boards. What were you? I don't know what you were, but you, were, you did a good job in helping him uh, get that book together. And so this is Pete Steinhauer, and... I would like to thank you, uh, as we are now official commemoration partners, on behalf of the Vietnam War commemoration, I would like to thank you for what you have done for your country. Good. So, good. I'll take the one or two is not good. Oh, okay, so we have uh, now joining us is Chris Whitney, who is the brand commissioner for the state of Colorado. Another interesting activities, and he also served in Vietnam. He is a CU graduate, and it is really my honor to have the Vietnam War Commemoration to thank you for your service. Well, you're most welcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he is near a 
up where they could stand up while they're sitting. This is our treasure friend, Sid Wilson, who has been always a treasure friend. But has been a treasure This is Sid Wilson. He is a uh, he has a company called The Private Guy who has taken all kinds of folks into the outdoors in ways that has made them more fully alive than they knew they were going to be. And so he has also been on the Saturday Night West Board as in fact this person has been as well. So on behalf of the Vietnam War Commemoration, I would like to thank you for your service. Thank you. Well, Sid and I went in the country the same day. <laughs> yep. So, okay, so okay this is, uh, is this easy for you to do? Where's your sign? Where's my sign? Patty held signs up at Yale. It is an interesting shift. I was an anti-war protester, but... Is that in my way right now? No. <laughs> <laughs> so on behalf of the Vietnam War Commemoration, uh, thank you. You. this thank is Jack Thompson, who's an important figure in our world here, and, and a professor, former professor, and, uh, and a Marine. Marie. And what? And a Marine. And a Marine. Marie. 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 So on uh, behalf of the Commemoration, thank you for this. Thank you. And I shall be um, your last name. Elliot. Elliot. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. okay. And this is uh, Jim Elliot, and he is, he has a wonderful son, which is all we can hope for in life, really, is that. And because of uh, the, the acquaintanceship that I ran into Jake, and I told him about this event, and he said, I think my dad would be interested. And he is a, a figure who we're going to learn more about. I, I've just met him two and a half hours an hour ago, so, so my uh, remarks are a little bit briefer here, but on behalf of the commemoration, Vietnam War commemoration, I would like to thank you for your service. Thank you. And now I may not be knowledgeable. Well, David has a pin. Yes, yes. And so that's the question. So I didn't know what he would have preferred. Well, he has to come up and hug me. That's right. That's totally right. So, well, David already has a pin, so I was going to go back and forth and dither a little bit about him since he didn't have a pin. But he still has not hugged me in, in public. He's had to hug me. He's never had a chance to, to do that. I don't mind hugging you. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. This is <laughs> And he is a graphic artist. and uh, It's an artist artist. Why would I be... I guess you could do abstract painter. Abstract painter. There you are. So grab my scene. I went on the wrong track there. But abstract painter and a good, good pal over years and was one of my first, um, gave me one of my first chances to talk to somebody who I'd gotten involved in this commemoration and David was really my first. This is why I'm involved in the commemoration. So, Dave Grochin, on behalf of the commemoration, I would like to thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. And now I need to know who I'm omitting. Um, am I omitting someone? Oh, excuse me, sorry. Yes, it was here. Pardon me. And now I'm going to be. I will remind you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is Skip P, who I run into quite a bit. I'm very fortunate you get on the bus or off the bus as I get. You get a lot of guys. Pretty frequent. Pastor Emily Chat, and he's thinking all the time, reading all the time. He has read things that I will never get around reading. He always tells me I should read them, and it's <laughs> So this is Skip Keith. And I always try and make the uh, Center for the American West um, lectures because he's really interested in what's an extraordinary experience. Thank you. Thank you. And that is an endorsement that no veteran ever needs to make for us, but we are very appreciative of you saying that. So thank you for your service. <laughs> Have I, uh, if you have an older looking person next to you, could you ask them? If I could? 
Didn't you serve with you? Oh, yeah. Well, yes, that's, that's true. And Very this good is an point. important we were, reminder. We were going for six weeks when I was Six weeks. Well, yeah. Yeah. And it is the families that we are, that I, I got the act of legislation that said it was veterans and their families. So, uh, Jeannie and Julie. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to say that we have a son who turned 50 on July 8th. Uh, of 1966, when his dad was in Vietnam, he left me nine months pregnant by a <laughs> child. <laughs> so I, the 50 year, and he's very involved. Well, I think we should. Okay. You know, so no, 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 no. You should. I mean, I said, what? Well, well, you say it out? I can give a really quick. Um, he left, uh, I went back to D.C., he been, he was at Quantico, he went down to uh, Fort Bragg, and then he went over, and, yeah, and uh, it was interesting, my best friend at the time lived in Baltimore, and her husband was over there with him, and there, the women had different ways of reacting. Her and dad put her head in the sand, she didn't want to do, think of any of it. And I could not wait to get home and look at Garrett Utley and see if I could figure out where man, because he was an advisor and he was in Plum Tree and Gway in that area. And I would try to figure out where he was. Mm -hmm. And I got very intermittent mail. I mean, it was two or three letters, what, every couple of weeks or something like that. But Bernadette just put her head in the sand, didn't want to deal with any of it. And I was absolutely the opposite. I have sections of grunts about the uh, lives that come. Yeah. Including some that uh, husbands didn't make it back yeah. uh, and had to deal with like raising children uh, yeah. without fathers. Yeah. 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 We don't seem to be having wives step forward. No. <laughs> so, uh, so I'll just, I mean, oh, good heavens, there's no, okay. No one knows their wives and they are uh, good souls. And, uh, okay, and they can't stop us inside. <laughs> One plug to Veterans Day here on the 11th of yes. November on campus. We're dedicating the new Veterans Memorial Lounge at the UMC. And hope to see everybody there. Our student leader will provide some insight awards to commemorate the Vietnam War once again on Veterans Day this year. So 11 o'clock on the 11th at the UMC. Veterans of other wars as well here. We have Jack Ravelli, who was in World War II. The class of '96 is still around. The class of '96 is the. No, I. That's how old I. Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to calculate that out, and then I was the one who acknowledged that we do have a conversation here. It's himself veteran. <laughs> it's a shame very much. And if I've left out others who were veterans of other wars, I can look at that. So uh, thank you very much. And this will be that the, the November 11th event will be a part of our commemoration as well. And we hope that you will keep joining us at these events and that you'll bring um, owls and friends and princes and. I do have a number of books if you're interested in for twenty dollars. They'd ask me to bring some up. Uh, many of you I know I've already read, so uh, these are ones I got just directly from the press. So, uh, and I'll be happy to sign whatever you want. Do you have grunts? I don't, uh, but you can get it on Amazon. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It is a remarkable book. Uh, the Horizon book is a remarkable book to read, and, and um, I. I'm just grateful for the Providence that gave me a chance to read that, and also grateful for the and the Providence that gave me. I'm a Western American historian, so it's not my terrain, but this has been a um, great privilege to be on your part.